frontier. This is Football Daft with Stephen Purden. Midfield dynamo and average actor. Chris Toll. Target man. Suspicious character. And... She's back to bring some festive cheer. It's our G4 Claims Angel Nicole to tell us about what the guys do over at G4. Nicole, how's it going? Hi, guys. I'm good, thanks. How's everyone? It's good to see you. What can you tell us this week? Something special, something that we don't know about G4 Claims that we've never known before. Right. Let me go right into it then. I was actually going to do that this week, by the way. I know that you prompted me, but there was a thing I was actually going to mention. So... If you've been involved in any sort of accident, um, you should always phone G4 Claims first. And I'll tell you why. Because sometimes you might think something's your fault because someone's told you at the roadside that it is your fault. That doesn't necessarily mean that's the case. Sometimes when you've been involved in an accident, you are in shock. You don't know what's happened. You can't remember. We can always look that up on Google Maps. Look at the load, road layout and where you've been, where they've been, the damage on their car, the damage on yours. That really tells you who is at fault normally. Um, the proof is in the pudding, as they say. So if you've been involved in any sort of accident, contact G4 Claims. If we can't help you because you've been at fault, we'll not waste your time. We'll tell you. We can't help you, but we'll put you in the right direction and guide you in the appropriate way. And if we can help you, then we can provide you with a like-for-like replacement vehicle. Um, we can get your car repaired and approved body shop. And if your car is written off, we will recover the pre-accident value for your car from the third-party insurance. So everything we do for you will be totally free of charge. We bill it all to the at-fault insurance company. If you're injured, we can deal with your personal injury compensation as well. And we do not take a percentage from you like the insurance do. All our services are free to you and we bill everything to the at-fault insurance. So it's G4 Claims. Phone us first. Non-fault accidents made easy. Let's welcome to Football Daft a man who, though played mainly as a striker, could play midfield or defence. As a Rangers player, he made over 500 appearances for the club, scoring 210 goals. He has three league winner medals, five league and Scottish Cup medals, and he has held the European Cup Winners' Cup trophy. He is an Ibrox legend, he's a radio legend, it's none other than Derek Johnson. DJ, how's it going, big man? Absolutely great, lads. Lovely to be on your programme. Looking forward to this immensely. DJ, what's this? What's happening with yourself now? Because uh, the last time I checked, have you got a kind of new role at Ibrooks right now? What's happening? Well, I, I do an ambassadorial role. You know, right. if there's anything to be done that, that the club want me to do, then you know I'll do it. You know, in the last few weeks they've had the new Rangers tartan that's come out. I you see know, you with a kilt on, DJ. Well, you're looking great with a kilt on. Thing, things like that. I mean, and it's something that I, I don't normally wear, but I really felt comfortable in it. I mean, the material, yeah. everything about it is just, you know, absolutely tremendous. So I'm doing these <laughs> things like that for them. You know, uh, any, anything well, that's needed to be done by the club that the players can't do at the moment or the manager can't, then I'll go and do it for them. So, and I'm there every home game, you know, along with 13, yeah, we, 14 other ex-players, the likes of Willie Johnson and Colin Steen, Ali Dawson, Gordon Jury. You know, the, a lot of the lads go around all the boxes at Ibrooks. You know, before the games and after the games and all that. So we're into that as well. Just enjoying myself. Keep myself ticking over. Aye, that sounds, that sounds bad, class. Man. That does, doesn't that it? Bob, it? Aye, that sounds class, man. That sounds brilliant. If you need them to go away, you Derek, man. You ain't great. You're always a good one, That sounds I've, brilliant. You used, I've, to, used I've to appear down I've what I used you, to I've do. seen you in the blue room. Aye. Who, me? The two of you have been Aye. in the blue room. Yes, yes. yes. Do, and also, Aye. I must admit... Uh, I need to come clean if people don't already know as well. Derek is uh, also occasionally my manager at the Rangers charity games. And uh, I must admit, you don't ever feel keen or comfortable to get me on that pitch, do you? (laughs) (laughs) No, listen, you've always got a game, put it that way. Aye, with 90 seconds to go. (laughs) (laughs) You you actually actually surprised me with your skill, to be perfectly honest. You might be a biggish lad, the same as me, but 
You've got no bad touch for an old fella, you. <laughs> I, re I remember one time we had been beat off the Celtic uh, legends about four or five games in a row. And I think no, we were no, 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 never, never. Ah, right. Well, you know, you, was... you, you know, we played something like nine times, and we won, we won five four on games for the season. There you go. Right. Well, there at least go. the first couple of games, Celtic were winning because I, I can remember in one of the games we were up, say it was we were maybe winning something like six two, and I was like, right, you'll put me on now, man. We've got, you know, there's four goals between the two teams, and you were like, and there was only three minutes to go. <laughs> <laughs> he's still get me on. The promoter's going like that. DJ, you need to get Grado on for the wins. And he's going, ah, you'll get, get on, you'll get on, you'll get on. <laughs> but you, 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 know, you, know, you know what he did as well? He comes on, and the first thing he does is wrestle with the centre halves. Aye, <laughs> aye. Comes on him and, you know, and backward flips and off. Oh, aye, flips, that's what I do. Aye, the full, the full lot. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're serious games, though, Grady, aren't they? They're oh, aye, very, very serious games. Especially if you're a supporter, if you're a Rangers fan and you see that Celtic shirt, you just want to go there and have a kick, and vice right. versa. But it's all, it's all in the best possible taste. Aye. What do you think of Rangers? Before we get into your career, what do you think of the Rangers this season? Well, I think you couldn't ask for a better start for them, to be perfectly honest. I think I think what, he's, what Stephen hasn't had you know, in, in the last couple of years, is that is a strong enough squad. He's maybe had a decent eleven, but any injuries or suspensions have struggled with the people who have brought in. You can't say that now. When, when you look at that mm -hmm. squad he's got, and you look at the bench. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just laden with people. If they come on, the, the team's not getting, going to get any worse. The team sometimes gets better when he brings the subs on. Yeah, I think yeah. He's, he's he's brought good players in, and now players are realizing. I think they've been there for a couple of years. They know what our club's all about. Every game is a cup final. I know it's an old say, yeah. it's an old cliche, but it's a fact. A lot of these mm -hmm. players that are playing for Rangers just now haven't really won anything. You know, and that's the difference between the team from the East End from Celtic. You know, they've, they've mm -hmm. got players that have won, you know, nine leagues in a row and all the trophies. You know, they've won it. So they know what winning's all about. Our lads don't know that yet, but I think they're realising as the months have gone on what it means to be a Rangers player. And if you come into Ibrox, as I was told at first, if you want to be second or third in the league or you want to be fighting relegation, then don't come here. Mm -hmm. This is not a place for you. We need to, to breed people that want to come here and win things. And I think maybe that is eventually getting through to a lot of players because there's that bit of consistency now. Now, they, yeah. they can't play well all the time. But the important mm -hmm. thing is when you don't play well, you win the games. That is so important. Mm -hmm. And that's what winners are all about. I know Rangers are getting all the praise just now and they deserve it 100%. They're doing well, but there's nothing won yet, Stephen. There's nothing well, won yet. Come the end of, of the season, if you've done well and you're winning trophies, then you can say things. I don't want players, the manager certainly won't come out and say they're going to win this and win that. I don't want player, even hear any players come out and say that. Rangers should be interested in their own performances. Just win the games. There's nothing you can do across the other side of the city. You just win your own games and let them think about you. We're in the lead and we're wanting to try and mm -hmm. keep that. But keep your feet on the ground. The, the one word that I would use again, as everybody does, every manager will use, is consistency. That's all we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. go out there, do your own thing, work hard, get the result and then look at the next game. Right. I, I think both teams are quite consistent now, aren't they, Derek? <laughs> 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 Listen, I can't be, on, on a serious note with that, I, mean, I can't believe the, the stick that Neil Lennon is getting. You know, he's, he's the Celtic manager and, and everybody's having a dig at him. But we're not talking about he's, for the last three years, he's won every trophy. I know people would say, well, if had no competition, it doesn't matter. You've still got to go out there and win games. He's had a bad six weeks, seven weeks or whatever it is. You know, won two games out of ten. But if he wins these games in hand, he's five points behind Rangers. You know, and, and that's surmountable in our league because we've still to play each other three times. And I think I think people in the West of Scotland, especially with the old firm fans, are very fickle. As soon as the Celtic the Celtic fans for the last few years, all they've been talking about is ten in a row. Ten in a row all the time. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a chance now Rangers are ahead that something might change this year. And I think a lot of them can't handle that. Because they've been so used to winning, mm -hmm. all of a sudden mm -hmm. there's a challenge for the first time in how many years? 
Aye. And I think it's got to a few of these supporters. And I was embarrassed for the club when I watched it the other night there, when they're outside, you know, shouting at their own players. These players that have won all these trophies for them and shouting at the manager and everything else. This this can change in a second. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. form, form is what it's all about. You're not telling me that all of a sudden Celtic have got a bad squad of players. They haven't. Aye. They're not playing well at this moment in time, but that can change. And I'm really, really surprised that the, the manager's getting stuck in. And, and well done to Dermot Desmond, who's listened to these fanatical Celtic fans, to be fair, who are absolutely raging. He's went, no, he's a manager. He's going to take us through that. So far, he's stuck by him. I mean, if, if it continues mm-hmm. the next three or four weeks, then he may well have to do something. But he's given the manager a chance, you know, to redeem himself. And it's, you, you can't only blame the manager again. You've got to look at players. It's the same players that have won all these things. All of a sudden, it's not mm-hmm. happening. They've got to get their confidence back as well. But that's as far as Celtic are concerned. The Rangers fans are delighted. I'm delighted where my team is because that's that's all I think about is Rangers. Yeah. And as long as they keep going the way they're going then, it could be a good season. And I stress it could be a good season. Definitely, mate. Definitely. We shall see, man, as the season goes on. But back to you, Derek, your career. So you do you remember where you were the day you, how you felt, whatever you signed for Rangers the day you signed? And how did the move come about? God, I can't remember. No, next question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I remember it. I remember it very well. I mean, my family was all Dundee United fans. I mean, I got six brothers, and as I keep saying, I can't, I can't get it through my head. My mum said she had seven boys, but I only had six brothers, so I could never ever work that. Out <laughs> <laughs> we all played football in the garden, in the street, and everything else. And uh, you know, I was probably the third best player in, in, in my family growing up because all my brothers played, and there were some they played junior football. They never ever went mm. senior. I was fortunate mm. enough, but because I was quite tall when I was 13, 14, I was I was nearly six foot. You know, so I stood I stood right. above a lot of players that I played against. So you would stand out, especially when you were scoring goals. As I was doing, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you know, a lot of clubs. I was, I was down at Aston Villa. I was down at Liverpool. I was down at Arsenal. Uh, Celtic wanted me. Big Jock Steen was in my house, wanting to sign me. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. He he came into my house and uh, said, "Would you like to play for Celtic?" And my second oldest brother, Bobby, who was looking after me, he may well have been the first ever agent. And he, he <laughs> said, to him, "He said, well, Mister Steen, he says there's there's a few clubs interested in him, but." Would there be any money involved? Because you know we were we were a, my my father had died when I was ten, and it was my mother that brought the seven of us up. You know it was very very hard going, and mm. my brother said, "Would there be any signing on fee?" And Jock said, "No, we've just won the, the the European Cup." He says, "We don't pay players to come and play. You've got to want to play for Celtic." And he gave it that. And my brother said, "Well, look, no problem." He says, "We'll get in touch with you." So mm. Jock went away, and ten minutes later. The car at the door, and the ranger scout came in, oh. and Tommy Gray was his name, and he, and he he'd said to my brother, he says, "I have not to leave your house until you sign for the Rangers." My brother says, "Well, yeah. that's entirely up to you." He says, uh, "He says, well, I'll tell you what we'll do." He says, "I know Jock Steen was here because I was down at the bottom of the street and I saw the car leaving." <laughs> he, say, he says, "I know you would offer you an awful lot of money, so what we are prepared to do is." <laughs> I'm, 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 and I was just about to, to jump in and say, well, no, he wouldn't have given him a brother. Aye, aye, a brother. Aye, aye. Oh, <laughs> your brother gave you a kick, I'm going to take. He would never <laughs> believe, he would never believe what he'd offered us. We couldn't believe it. He says, well, what we're going to do is, and we're now talking about 1968. And he says, well, Derek, we'll give you £2,000 and we'll give your mum £2,000. Now, wow. £2,000 was, was over a year's wages in 1968. Wow. I mean, it was just mm-hmm. mega, mega money. Right. And my brother, my brother said to me, what do you think? I says, I'm signing for the Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it, it, it was as simple as that. And then two or three weeks later, you know, I was in at Ibrooks training and uh, and that was it, met all the lads. And I just absolutely loved it. I'd never been out of Dundee in my life. Mm-hmm. And they got me a, a train ticket for a six-monthly train ticket. So I, I went through most weekends and all the holidays and everything else. And I just really loved through in Glasgow. I just loved it. Uh, I, I stayed with a boy brilliant. called Derek Renton, who was another, he was two years older than me, but he'd been playing in the third team. I remember saying to him one day, I said, 
how long will it be till I get in the third team? He says, well, how old are you? I says, well, I'm 16. He says, well, it might be two or three years before you're in the third team and maybe give it an hour two years for the second team. And by the time you get the first team, you're maybe talking seven, eight years. So you'll be sort of mid-twenties before you get a game. And looking three months later, I'm in the first Aye, team. exactly. So you know, it, was, it, was as, it was as quickly as that, simply because that was the era, if you remember, that Celtic were halfway through their nine in a row. Aye, they were the aye. main. They were the main team, and Rangers were toiling. So I, I got my chance very, very early, simply because of that. Aye, uh, so do you think that uh, it's a lot of like you came in when you were sixteen? Do you believe if you're good enough, you're old enough, yeah. or do you, do you think in this like day and age they maybe need a wee bit more? Like I think I think John Greg said. Kind of. John Greg said to me when I went in there, he says you're a big lad for sixteen because I was built like a man. You know, when you're six mm-hmm. feet, you know, I wasn't as heavy then. I was maybe about just just under 10 and a half stone, which wasn't bad for a young lad at 16, but mm-hmm. I was built like a man. You see, so you can handle the physical pressure that goes on uh, in our game. You know, as, whereas I, I remember watching Wayne Rooney making his debut for Everton against Arsenal at 16. And Wayne mm-hmm. Rooney, he, even he's the same size now as he was Aye, then. that's right. Aye, he aye, that's true, aye. solid, you know, and strong. So mm-hmm. I, th- I think if, if you've got the physicality, physicality, then why shouldn't you be? You know, at 16, 17, if you're good enough to go there and, and, and you can score goals and you can play, you can handle yourself, then why not? Like, when you go to, like, obviously you score the goal in the League Cup final, Derek, you're only 16. Uh, is, is it right? Is it Willie Waddle was the manager then? Willie Waddle was, yeah. Did, yeah. did you know you were playing? How Did you know in advance you were playing or was it just sprung on you? He, after training, under. after training on the Friday, and, and these days we didn't go away. Some nowadays they go away down to Largs or wherever overnight, you know, so the players mm-hmm. can all get peace. Nobody's phoning them for tickets or anything else. You used to go home, and I went home that day. I was just, I was just about to go out the front door into the taxi, and, and Jock Wallace and Willie Waddle dragged me into the the boot room and said, "Look, there's four tickets. Bring your family tomorrow. You're playing. Uh, I'm sorry, you're playing." I says, well, you'll need to give me six tickets because I've got six brothers. <laughs> and, his, and his words to me were, and pardon the French, was fuck off. <laughs> uh, but, but, so I, I took the tickets home. I, I can remember go through, going back on the train and it was the 10 past one train from Queen Street to Aberdeen, which stopped at Dundee. And the, 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 there was a boofy train on it. And the man in charge of that was Dennis Law's brother, whom I really? got to know throughout the year, right. throughout the months that I was there. And uh, he was a big Rangers fan. And, it, and I told mm-hmm. him I was playing and he couldn't believe it. I actually got my steak and chips for nothing that day. He says, that's what you're getting. I need to build you up for tomorrow. So he gave me my steak and chips for nothing, which, which was great. And he was telling me that Dennis was a big Rangers fan as well, because right. he, he, he loved Jim Baxter. That was his hero. Right. So obviously right. the Baxter, the Rangers thing, that was it. But I remember eating and that was it. I just can't remember the rest of the journey. I went in and told my family and they all, they all enjoyed that. And eventually my mum and, and the second oldest brother came through and there was another couple that I gave the, the tickets to because my brothers wanted to listen to the game on the radio. It was not never on the telly live. It was always right. on the radio in these days. But, you know, we were supposed to meet at Ibrooks at half 11 on the Saturday, have lunch and then, you know, get the team talk and then go to Hamden. I got there at, I think it was round about between half nine and quarter to ten. I mean, I had, I, I think I opened up Ibrooks that morning. There was no there. <laughs> but I, I, I didn't want to be late, you know, simply that because you know, if, if the train broke down or whatever and I was late. So I made mm-hmm. sure I got there early, you know, and, and the rest is history, really. Just going out there and Greggy and, and Alex McDonald were brilliant to me and Sandy Jardin. You know, they, they talked me through it even before it when I was nervous. And we'd, 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 uh, we'd got there and we'd got there and went into the dressing room and it was half one. Remember, it's the three o'clock kickoff. And I was ready at 20 to two with all my gear on. <laughs> we hadn't even been out in the park to see it first. <laughs> and Greggy says, get your gear on. I had to go and put all my gear on again and go outside onto the park. <laughs> but that, but that's, how, that's how excited I was. It, Aye, it was, it was just great being there, 106,000. At the game that it's day, mental. you know, it, you couldn't hear yourself think, and it was mm-hmm. absolutely fantastic. And the thing was, I couldn't celebrate with the boys after the game because I was only sixteen. 
aye, aye, aye. And, and I, I was heading for Iceland the next day with the Scotland under 18 team. As a matter right. of fact, John Gregg's uncle, I went and stayed with him the night. Uh, and right. then he drove me to the airport, you know, went away. And I couldn't believe it because one of the, the first pe people I met at congratulated me was Graham Sooners. Oh, really? Right. He, right. He's, he's a couple of months older than me. And he was, a, he was right. the captain of the, the under 18 Scotland team. So that's right. when I knew him. I knew him way, way back then. That's interesting, man. That but, is. See, you're, what happened after that in terms of, Derek, you're, you're switching positions, playing at centre half. How did that come about? Was it because of your size? No, it, it was funny because we were playing. I remember, uh, I mean, Jock Wallace and, and Willie Wardle used to come to all the reserve games as well. We were playing down at Somerset Park. We are playing here United, uh, mm -hmm. and it was a reserve game. I'd, I'd been injured for a couple of weeks, and he... He, he always came back uh, in the reserves to get to get some game time. And Colin Jackson and, and Ronnie McKinnon were playing because they were coming back from injury as well. So I was on the bench. I was sat on the bench in the reserves. And within 10 minutes, Colin Jackson got injured again. So he's coming off and, and, and Willie Waddle said to me, have you ever played in defence? I says, Gaffer, I don't mind where I play. If you want me to play in goals or play, I just want a game. He says, well, mm -hmm. go on and play centre half. And that was the first time that I'd worn, you know, I'd, I'd played at the back for Rangers. And he couldn't believe it because I was I was taking the ball off the goalkeeper and coming out and want to come over the halfway line and pass it. He says, you don't, dude, you're a defender. You don't come over the halfway line, except if we've got a corner or a free kick or something, you go up. But I, really, I just really, really enjoyed it. And, it, and it, that was the first time I'd played it seriously. I said, I played at school now and again. Uh, in centre half, but it's the first time I'd played for Rangers, and, and he said to me after the game, "You know, that's a great thing to have." He says because if you can't get a game up front, you've every chance now of getting a game at the back. Aye, now I know that you can not. play there, Aye. and that that Aye. worked exactly the same in midfield as well. As as the years went on, uh, and playing me in midfield as, as a man marker, you know that that was that was that's what he saw me as, just marking somebody else out of the game. So it was great. So I had three three chances of getting a game either up front, at the back, or in the middle. And that's what disappoints me nowadays when I see young kids playing and the, the, and the manager picks them, oh, I can't play right midfield, I'm a centre mid. And <laughs> never mind, if, if the manager Aye. thinks you're good enough, just go Aye. and play. It's the matter where mm -hmm. he picks him. If he wanted me to go in goals, I would go, as I did go in goals. I played one game in goal for Rangers. We went really? over to Canada and America uh, after the season finished for a month. Uh, to play lots of teams out there. And big Peter McCloy got injured, and so did Stuart Kennedy. So the guy <laughs> says, does anybody want to go and go? I says, I'll go in. <laughs> and we'll, we'll, and I, I think we'll win 3 nothing. So I'm the only Seriously? goalkeeper, I think, that's played in gold and never lost a goal. <laughs> amazing. 100% clean right? sheet record. That's clean amazing. sheet, ags, exactly. Another record. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, Derek, what, see, in that um, era in Fitba, what was the sort of lifestyle like back then? Obviously, now we've got the mega wages in football and it's people going about it. But what exactly was it like, like in this in the seventies, early eighties? Well, the way the wages were well, well, the wages wages were good. Don't get me wrong for that era, but we weren't, we weren't earning much more than than a gas fitter or an electrician Aye. was making. You know, if they were making twenty five pound a week, we were getting thirty five. You know, well, certainly I was. Maybe Greggy at that time and, and Sandy Jarden, people like that who were experienced would probably get more. But that, but that was my first wage at 16 when I signed a new contract. I was on £25 a week. You know, and after, after the two years was up, I was on 60 You know, So the money was going up, but it wasn't massive. I mean, mm -hmm. nowadays when you're looking at the thousands they're getting a week, even youngsters, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. But we, I, just, I just wanted to play football. It was a job to me. Because mm -hmm. it, it was giving my mum a few quid, you know, for the house, you know, for the messages and to pay the rent and everything else. And it was good. I was just enjoying, enjoying myself coming through on the train and training and playing the games and coming home again. It was, it was just, it was just really, really good. It was only once it got on to the late 70s. You know, I, we were talking about 1978 when, when we went to Argentina with Scotland. Uh, so I'd been playing eight years, basic, basically. And my wages were probably 100 quid, 120 mm. pound a week by then. You know, then you would, you would go and you would go to Argentina and you're sitting beside uh, some of these English lads. You were talking about on five and six hundred pounds a week, mm. 700 pounds, you know, things like that. You're going, how on earth can you, you get that? 
And that's why right. all the lads from the, the 70s and that all went down there right away, because the wages were incredible, even more so now. Right. I mean, they're decent now up here in Scotland for, for the old firm, you know, for certain players, it's good wages, but still down south, there's people there mm -hmm. making 10, 20 times more than players right, that are playing so. for, for Rangers and Celtic. You know, so but money was money was never a big thing for me. Later on in life, when when uh, and when you got to your mid twenties, you realise and well, I like to buy a flat, but never really had enough money to buy a flat. You know, and that's mm -hmm. when you started thinking, well, wonder if the club's going to give me more money or am I going to have to leave? My contract was up in nineteen seventy eight when I came back from the World Cup, and uh, was my was my contract Colin Jackson and Sandy Jarden, the three of us. And uh, we were in seeing Willie Waddle and he was saying, no, he's, you're not getting any more money. Why don't you sign the two-year deal? There were no agents in. Mm -hmm. And eventually the three of us all signed for £10 extra a week. <laughs> £10 extra a week. And there wasn't even a signing on fee. That is mental. But not even a signing on fee. Nothing. No. Just an extra 10 and a week. W Willie yeah. Waddle was like that. We called him the Chancellor. That was him. <laughs> 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 Kept all the money himself. Never gave it to the players. That's for sure. <laughs> Willie Waddle, the Chancellor. Derek, talk us through, obviously, your 18 European Cup Winners' Cup. What, how did, I mean, 16-year-old scoring against Celtic in the League Cup final, 18-year-old European Cup Winners' Cup medal. I mean, what was that like, winning the final for Rangers? Well, with, I think I think we realised halfway through the season we were struggling in the league for some strange reason. You know, we're, we're a good side, but Europe was the one that took our fancy that year. And mm -hmm. we never, ever thought we'd get to the final, but we had a couple of good results in the first couple of rounds. And remember, I think we only played about six games to win it in mm -hmm. these days. Uh, it was all knockout. And, uh, you know, the, the league sort of went for us. We were beaten in the two cups. All we had left was Europe. So I, I mm -hmm. think the lads had resigned themselves to saying, we'll put all of our eggs in the one basket. Let's, let's go for this. And for some strange reason, you know, it, it paid off. I, I played in, I think it was four of the games leading up to the final. I played in the semi-finals, the, the two games against Bayern Munich, which I feel even to this day, and even though we won the, the cup uh, in, in the final, I think the semi final against uh, Bayern Munich Ibrox is the best game I've ever played in Aye. and the best atmosphere as well but the cup final itself I was maybe a wee bit fortunate to play maybe a wee bit fortunate because remember uh, Ronnie McKinnon broke his leg mm -hmm. in the quarterfinals against Sport in Lisbon so he was out for the season Colin Jackson got injured uh, a week before the end of the season an ankle injury and he was really toiling he didn't train or anything before the final and the, the boss had said to him, look, I'm going to give you up until the last day, you know, to see if you'll pass a fitness nice. test. And, and I remember him going out in the morning of the game and uh, we didn't see it um, and getting the fitness test, but Jock and Willie Waddle came to the room. I was rooming with Greggy, single beds. And, uh, <laughs> he just came in and he says, look, get a good sleep this afternoon because you're playing. And it was, nice. I, I thought it was a great feeling getting picked for the, the League Cup final but uh, to be in a European final, Christ almighty, it was an incredible. So obviously I never slept a wink, to be fair. But Davy Davy Smith, for me, was the man of the match. On it. I mean, we went out into the pitch and he talked me through the game. Mm -hmm. You know, the greatest thing he said to me was, listen, whenever the ball comes up to the striker, try and get in front of him, take the ball off him. Or if the ball's in the mm -hmm. air, go through him, win that ball in the air. Because if you miss it, I'll be at your back. And that oh, was all fine. the confidence I needed. That gave me the right to go mm. and try and win the ball, knowing mm. that he was at my back. And if you remember that night as well, he set up two of the goals going mm. forward. I mean, not only a great sweeper and a great defender, yeah. but, you know, could set up goals as well. It was, it was just surreal. I mean, after scoring the three goals and the fans coming on after the goals, I mean, it was, it was incredible. I think the game must have lasted about five hours by the time we all got <laughs> off the pitch and we got started again. It was fantastic going three nothing up, but and again the gaffer said, "Look, it's half time. You know, just Aye. keep your concentration." Well, I lost a, a soft goal, a soft goal, a stupid goal, and then about eight nine minutes to go, we lost the second. But there was never any panic. I think Greggy mm -hmm. sorted everybody, and so did Sandy. They never really created Aye. after that. We saw the game out, but a fantastic feeling as well to be the only Rangers side that's ever won a European trophy. You know, of course, and, mate, of course. The, I never thought it would be 50 years and they still hadn't won. They'd been yeah. in the finals, but not won them. But 
Aye. But I remember Wally Waddle saying to us in the dressing room, he says, you know, they'll be talking about this game in 50 years from now. And we went, Aye. yes, so they will, 50 years. And there you are. Oh, two, there we are. Exactly. two years to go for it. Two years to go for it. And uh, we're talking about it again. There's going to be a big do and everything else. Aye. Which is going Aye. to be fantastic. Aye. I bet you didn't think you'd be talking to us three arseholes about it after 50 years. <laughs> no, hey, listen, absolute pleasure to talk to you, lad. Great to talk to football people. Football people are lovely. Exactly. Would you say, obviously, Derek, that's the greatest moment of your Rangers career? Yes. Well, to win the Aye. European Trophy, I mean, until another Rangers team does it, you know, you're unique. These 11 players will go down in history, you know, ah, as far course, as the definitely. football clubs are concerned. And that's it. And listen... And I hope you know a Rangers team does win a European trophy because right. I want to see that. But uh, right. yeah, it has to be. I mean, there's been many great, as I said, the Bayern Munich game was fantastic. Probably the best game I've played in. But to actually win the final and, and win the trophy was magnificent. Still right. got the medal up the stairs, treasure it all the time. Brilliant. Brilliant. Superb. Yes. But see, what I wanted to ask you was... Um, because you had two spells at Rangers. How did your, your your first spell at Rangers come to an end? What what happened there? You didn't you played with Chelsea. What was the, the deal Chelsea. there? Well, what happened was Graham Sunis. <laughs> Aye. Really? Graham Sunis' first words to me were you're freed. Really? So I went, well, I said, well, thanks very much. That was very kind of you, Mr. Sunis. But no, he was building a side, remember. You know, we, we were Aye. down at the depths then. And uh, they, they brought him in and they were going to give him money. He knew that. And uh, he was going to build the team. So all the old ones, I mean, I was 29, 30. I had a few injuries, I, 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 two dicky ankles as well. I was having to get strapped up for training, never mind playing right. games. And he looked around and there was maybe five or six players from that squad. He, he just let them go. Yeah. And, that, and, and that was it. The only, I think the only one that he, he kept that was older was big Peter McCloy. But he, mm-hmm. he wanted them there, you know, to, to do the goalkeepers and whatnot and everything else. So he was getting a job there. But that was the most disappointing thing in my life. You know, you just, you, you, I'd been there for the majority of my footballing career to eventually it, it comes to an end. You know, it, it, was, mm. it was incredible. Mm. And then to be fair to Chelsea, you know, they, they've, they've taken me on. Uh, and what they said to me there was, he says, we're, we're short up front and at the back. So you'd be a good player. He said, I'm no guaranteeing you first team games. He says, but, you know, mm. if, if needed, then you'll certainly be on. So I, I was glad yeah. to go down and play for a club like Chelsea, who were in the old second division then, right. Chelsea. Right. Uh, and uh, when I was there, we got up, and remember the first division was the, the top division. Aye. It was just division one, two, three there. So when mm-hmm. I, we got to the top division the year I was there, uh, and, and they've been there ever since, they've never gone down again. But I enjoyed myself at Chelsea, but you don't realise how good a club or how big a club Rangers is until you leave it. Until you leave. We went down there and their training facilities were terrible <clears throat> for a, a team like Chelsea. I mean, they're, they're probably the best in the, in the world now, training mm-hmm. ground, because of the mm-hmm. man that's in there. He's got plenty Aye. of money to spend on it. Aye. But it wasn't Aye. then. But uh, and, and I was doing there staying next door to big Joe McLaughlin, who used to play for Morton. He was a centre half at Chelsea. Mm-hmm. And a boy called uh, David Speedy. He was oh, aye, David Speedy. Aye, aye, David Speedy. He, he played aye. for Chelsea as well. So it was him that kept me at the team. Him and a lad called Kerry Dixon, who was the striker as well. So they're, they're a decent side. I, I never played all that many games. And eventually when, when, when Jock came back in, he got me up the road. And what he said to me was at Rangers, he says, listen, I might, I might not play you in the first team again, but I want you to play in the reserves and try and bring forward all the young players that we've got in there. I said, mm-hmm. absolute pleasure to do that, Gaffer. And I did that mm-hmm. for about two months. And then Big Jock got the sack. Well, wow. so, so Derek, you know, at the end of your career, you, you toiled a wee bit with, with management, but you've spent most of the last uh, couple of decades in media. <laughs> what was, <laughs> sorry, make you feel old there, a couple of decades, spent the last couple of decades in media. Was, it's, um, it's, it's actually 30 years. Ah, there you go. Three, uh, three, yeah. decades, yeah. three decades. I mean, is that something that was offered to you? Was it something yeah. that you, you had in mind or you just took the ball and ran with it? Well, I didn't have it in mind, but I was doing a wee bit before, when I was still playing. You know, right. we didn't have a game on a Wednesday night and there was a game on uh, Radio Clyde. Richard Park was the main man at Radio Clyde then. He's the name that you have to name. But uh, Richard Park was yeah. the main man. He fronted the programme. Jerry McNee was there doing Jerry the McNee. And I used to do a wee bit for him as well. 
I used to do wee bits for them on a Wednesday. So when I finished, the, the first people that come into me was was Radio Clyde. Mm-hmm. Would you like to join us? And I went, oh, absolutely brilliant. So right. if you're not playing it, at least you can talk about it. Exactly. So I, I enjoyed right. that, as I say, for nigh on three decades. I did that and I, and I, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Who was your favourite pundit to work with, Eric? Well, I enjoyed working with Paul Cooney, believe it or not. Paul okay. Cooney Go and radio. I worked for maybe 10 Go radio, years I... together on the radio. He was he, he, he fronted the programme. But, you know, Kivo's been there for longer than me. He's been there for 35 years, Hugh right. Kivins. And Hugh, Hugh's down the line. I mean, a lot of people give him the, the, the Celtic stuff. And yeah, he probably is a Celtic fan. But the end of the day, the end of the day, every pundit's a fan of one club or other, or another. It's mm-hmm. as simple exactly. as that. And Hugh, uh, you didn't you didn't get any football as a to be a pundit by no being a fan of somebody. You know what I mean? You've yeah, you've grown exactly. up with the game. You, yeah, you're right. Same with referees. Referees when they're younger, when they were ten and twelve, didn't want to be a referee. They wanted to be a footballer. Mm-hmm. So they played. So they had a team. And all of a sudden, you become a, a referee. So you, you had a team. You know, and that, that's why I feel for a lot of referees because there's so many referees get called, you know, your blue nose or your green nose, you know. <laughs> they just accept it nowadays. They, they, just, they just get the job done. Uh, it might hurt inside of, if some of them are a supporter yeah. of one of the clubs, you know, but uh, it's, it's one of these things. You, they do their job and that's it. You're always going to get criticised out there, no matter what you do from some right. people. You get any kind of memories of a crazy phone call? That you had in, with the phone, and have you ever had like any kind of that? You know I mean, one that really stands the, 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 out. You go, that's a nutter. Well, you, well, we've got plenty of them. We've got plenty of them over on the program. Never mind. <laughs> there, there was one phone phone, and it was great. It was it was uh, an old firm game at, at Ibrooks, and uh, we, we're, we're choosing our man of the match, and uh, I think we all went for for Andy Gorham. He'd had one of these games where he was outstanding. Man, I'm Andy Gorham. So we'll go on to the open line. And this boy comes on from Govan and said, uh, I cannot believe it. You gave the man in the match to Andy Gorham. He said, he'd one or two saves. He said, but that's what goalkeepers have to do. That's their job to save it, to save the ball. He says, how on earth can you give it a goalkeeper of that? He says, I think that's absolutely ridiculous. There was far better players that were playing on the day rather than Andy Gorham. So Hugh said to him, well, the, the usual saying, well, were you at the game? He went, no, I was just listening to it on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> Hugh, said, Hugh said to him, how, how do you know? If you weren't there and you were only listening to it. He says, well, you asked us to phone in and see who our man of the match was. What am I supposed to do? Sit here and say fuck all? <laughs> 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 so, 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 remember, so remember on radio there's a seven second delay so as soon as he squares the wee boy presses the button so the last seven seconds is gone so you don't hear it but we do but we do so when it comes brilliant. back to us after the seven seconds is up we are all laughing like hell so people are in there going what are you laughing at <laughs> he doesn't know what we've heard but, but there's a lot of people like that. I mean, whoever fronts it, it's always got to have his finger on the pulse there. I bet you. Yeah, something does swear or says something bad, especially nowadays. I know. You can't say anything. No, they'll, they'll, just, they'll, all. they'll just they'll just put them off if that is the case. Aye. That is brilliant. <laughs> well, DJ, honestly, it's been brilliant listening to you, mate. But the time has come for a quiz. Are you up for it? A quiz, right? Okay. Aye. John Sutton and Chick Young are joint top with fifteen. We've got Mark Wilson, Keith Lasley, tucked in behind with 14. We've got a good Dr. Kenny Jucker and Kevin Harper just behind in third place with 13. Other selected scores include Murdo McLeod on 10, Jonathan Watson on 9, Bob Malcolm on 6, and Falkirk Which... manager David McCracken is at the bottom on 1. So anybody one you want to be there? Hopefully I get 2. Hopefully I get 2. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so we're putting, it. The, we're putting 90 seconds on the clock, Derek. You can't pass... You must give an answer, oh, no, all right? I'm pass, because you can't think... Can't pass. Can't pass, mate. Can't right, pass. See the thing is, Derek, see, see if you don't know the answer, just say anything. Uh, right, no. just give any sort of answer. That's ex- that's basically a pass, mate. All right, okay. Exactly. All right. Exactly. Great, do you want to ans- ask your questions, mate? Let's do it then, mate, to just see if there's anything I need mean, to mispronounce. No, we're all right. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> right, <laughs> thanks, John. Yep. And the time starts now. Who is the current manager of Sheffield Wednesday? Jim Denny. 
What are Albion Rovers home colours? Home. What was that? What are Albion Rovers home colours? Uh, red and white. Dundee United bought Lauren Shanklin from which club? Air United. Who played in goals in the 90, 1970 League Cup final with you? Peter McCloy. In what league would you find East Stirlingshire? Uh, it's second division. In what season did you win the treble? 76. And which club are nicknamed the Bees? The Bees. Brentford. Michael Palin supports which Scottish club? Rangers. Who is the current manager <laughs> of Forfa? Uh, Archie Knox. <laughs> Fourth Bank is the home to what team? Sorry? Fourth Bank is the home to what team? Third Lanark. Time! (laughs) (laughs) We'll go through the wrong answers, will we? (laughs) (laughs) Current manager of Sheffield Wednesday is Tony Pulis. Um, Tony Pulis. He just joined them a a couple of weeks back. Albion Rovers are red and yellow, not red and white. Um, East Stirlingshire are in the Scottish Lowland League now. Derek, I, I, I've got down here, and I can't believe this is this 77 78 season was when you won the treble. Is that right? 76 77. Was it 76 there you 77? Go. Yeah. Right, there Sir John. Right. Take that. There That's a go. point for Derek. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Michael Palin supports Dennis Muir. Um, there's always a Dennis Muir question in our uh, questions. Yeah. Um, Jim Weir's the current manager of Four Far, and Fourth Bank is the home to Stirling Albion. So you got four. Four, yeah, four, right. four. That was good, man. Oh my god. I was passing <laughs> my shell oh, 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 <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> <laughs> Eric, it's been an absolute man. pleasure having you on, mate. I appreciate you coming on, mate. Thank uh, you so much. You're amazing. very welcome, lads. Thanks, Derek. That was, that was good quality. I, that was take care, DJ. Hopefully, see you soon, big man. All right. Take care. All right. All right. All All At Football Daft, we want to help you with this brand new way to beat the bookies. It's called TradeMateSports.com. The only way to achieve long-term profitability from sports betting is to take value for the bookies. Imagine if your pal told you, I'll give you $50 if this coin lands on heads, but if it lands on tails, you have to give me 40 You would take that bet as many times as possible as your winnings hugely outweigh the outgoings. This is exactly what TradeMate Sports Day but they date in sports betting. They work in real time to highlight value bets so you can easily beat the bookies. Become part of their community. They've made 5.85 million euros for value betting by starting a free trial, by using the link in the episode bio. Alex for TradeMate Sports has made info and some top tips for this weekend. G'day everyone, before I get into my tips for today, I firstly wanted to talk a little bit about how you find value in sports betting. So we've given lots of examples about the coin toss and stuff like that, but how you actually find value is by beating the closing line. So the closing line is the last odds on a game. So let's just say this weekend we've got Manchester City versus Fulham. The last price that you see for Manchester City before the game kicks off. And that price has all of the information of a sports betting match or a you know a football match all into those odds. So, you know, betting syndicates, recreational punters, you know, uh, any anyone or anyone that's bet on that game, all that information has gone into those odds and created that price for Manchester City. So if you can beat that price, that price is the most uh, like accurate way of describing what Manchester City City's uh, odds are of winning the game rather than the price that was maybe two, three, four days ago when no one was really betting into it. So if you can beat that price, that almost ensures long-term profitability from sports betting. It's the only measurement that we can use to, uh, to show that what you're doing or your strategy is successful. So when you find value, it's by beating the closing line. It's not by you know your opinion or um, 
or if you know whether you think the odds are, are too big on Arsenal or Manchester City, whatever, it's by beating that closing line. So keep that in mind if you're trying to find value by yourself, or at least you know you can try Trade Mate Sports and it'll do it all for you. Um, on to the tips now. Two tips for this week in the Premier League. So we've got Burnley versus Everton. We're going for under two and a half in this one, and see if you can find odds of at least 1.95 or bigger. Uh, and the other one is Manchester City versus Fulham, uh, over 3.75 goals. And that is also, that is at 2.05 odds. So see if you can find that or better. Um, yeah, and good luck with your betting this weekend, guys. Cheers. So get involved with TradeMateSports.com right now and support Football Daft by checking out the link in the episode bio or heading to our social media, Football Daft Pod on Twitter, or just playing old Football Daft on Facebook. Let's get bookie bashing. Audio Frontier.